Okay, we're going to jump right into Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. In the year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved in the heart of the king, of Cyr king Cyrus of Persia to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem in Judah. In Judah, anyone of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go back to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people, and the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide with silver and gold and goods and livestock and whatever free will offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So then we're told that everyone who God had placed on their heart to go back to Jerusalem uh, were free to go back to Jerusalem. And not only that, if you keep going, verse 6, all their neighbors assisted them with the articles of silver and gold and goods and livestock and valuable gifts in addition to free will offerings. So their neighbors gave them valuables to bring back. And not only that, we keep reading, King Cyrus brought out all the articles of the temple that Nebuchadnezzar, 70 years earlier, had taken out of the temple before the temple was uh, decimated. <clears throat> Do you just marvel at how God works all things, what we talk about very often? History is his story, and God is working all things uh, according to his huge and wonderful and awesome plan for all of humanity. Um, the principle here is God's will will be done, and often God pays the way. God made the way, and he paid their way in this, at, this, at this point. So out of the 7 million Jews that were in exile in, the, in, in Persia, we're told about only 50,000 went back. Um, and I kind of don't blame them because it is kind of scary. I mean, to think about they, a lot of them left their homes. They left uh, probably extended family. They left their jobs. They probably had well-established businesses. They left the comforts of Persia. Um, and so the principle that we see here is that often those courageous enough to obey God's call are often in the minority. And we also learn too from these courageous Jews that obedience to the Lord sometimes means that we're gonna be less comfortable and more fearful. But that's an okay place to be because there's nowhere better than to be in the hands of your loving Heavenly Father who will never leave you, he will never forsake you, he has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Um, and even through difficulties, God will give you the courage and the comfort, right? And you will see his purposes come to fruition, both in you and through you, all for his glory. God will build your faith. When you obey him, he will build your faith, and he will refine your character through your circumstances, and it's all his doing. We move into Ezra 2, and we see that the 50,000 Jews that left were <coughs> mentioned here uh, in the word. Um, so God gave, God honored their courage and their obedience by allowing for their names to be written in his, uh, his holy word. And that's awesome because there's, God has another book and it's called the book of life. And we who have given our lives to Jesus that have trusted in the forgiveness of our sins uh, in Jesus at the cross uh, for all who have asked Jesus to forgive their sins and to make him their Lord and Savior uh, we are all written in God's book of life and what an honor and what a privilege that is and we kind of like the exiles here these um, exiled Jews that are going back to their homeland we're kind of exiled also because this world is not our home we know once we we, we are God's children, our home is in heaven, and we are kind of making our way back to heaven. And God has work for us, just like he had for the Jews to go back and rebuild. He has work for us. We are told in Ephesians 2, verse 10, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. And for us who are able to um, walk through those good works, for God to do those 
uh, good works for us, that when we obey God in doing the good works that he has ordained for us to do, right, we will bring glory to Jesus in eternity, uh, in heaven for eternity. Um, and that's what, what it's about, right? Because Jesus commanded us in the Sermon on the Mount to be more concerned about building uh, treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth. So God has work for us to do here. God sends this, um, just like he did for the Jews. Now God sends these 50,000 back uh, to Jerusalem under the uh, headship of uh, a man named Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the governor or appointed governor at that time. Uh, my study notes in my Bible say that he uh, is um, the last descendant of David that actually held some kind of public office. Um, and you will see if you look at Jesus' lineage that he is an, uh, an ancestor of Jesus. So it's kind of cool. Um, God's keeping that line going. Um, so uh, chapter 3, Ezra, they come back. And the very first thing they do, uh, verse 3, we're told, despite their fear of the people around them, they built the altar on its foundation and they sacrificed burnt offerings to the Lord. To me, that told me that uh, before they were concerned about their comfort, before they were concerned about their own homes, before they were concerned about getting their lives together, they put God first. And the prescribed way to worship the God, to worship God at this point in time, God had ordained that they do it through sacrifices. So they put God first, worshiping God first. Uh, what a great priority to always have in the forefront of our minds. And this caused, we are told, if you continue reading through chapter 3, um, to cause great joy. Um, there was actually uh, shouts of joy uh, and adoration and worship and praise. Um, and then the people that had seen the previous temple before it was destroyed and had been taken into exile and came back and saw the foundation laid, they, we are told, they were weeping for joy. So it must have been an amazing scene. I hope we get to see the, uh, <laughs> the clips in heaven. <laughs> um, so in, now, um, now we go into chapter Ezra chapter 4. Here's where it gets very interesting. Verse 1, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and they and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and we've been sacrificing to him since the time of Ezra Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. What does Zerubbabel tell them? He says, you will have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Wow, that seems harsh, <laughs> right? A little intolerant, a little uh, uh, not open-minded, right? But Zerubbabel had discernment to know that these were enemies of God and he was not going to be fooled by this false veneer of, of their words, of what they were saying, right? We... Um, are very fearful of offending people in our culture. And I'm talking we, not only individually, but we the church, right? We're afraid of looking intolerant. Mm -hmm. We're afraid of our reputation. And I'm talking the church too. We're afraid of our reputations being tarnished. We're afraid of lawsuits. We're afraid of looking bad, right? So we bend over backwards for those people that we know are enemies of the gospel. And if these people really were wanting to help and genuinely, you know, pure in their motives of wanting to help, I would think that the response would go something like this. Okay, I know we were enemies before and we are sorry for that. So we understand that you don't believe our words. So we will show you when you come through our, I'm just making this up. When you come through our land, you know, we will pull the logs for you. We will give your stone cutters a break. We will give your people food and water, and we will prove to you that we are being honest and integrity. We will prove with our actions, right? Because Jesus said that you will know them by their fruit, right? Not so much their words, but their actions. So, but that's not how they responded. Let's see how they responded. Mm -hmm. Verse four, 
and the people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus and into the king of King Darius. They revealed their hearts by their actions, right? Zerubbabel was right, right? They were plants to distract them, to dissuade them, to discourage them. I read this the first time. I didn't see this the first time. I went back and I read it. They hired counselors to frustrate them. I'm like, those are basically lawyers. <laughs> they sued the Jews, if you want to look, look at it in our, in our wording, right? And, and if you keep reading through um, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, they sent nasty letters to the kings. And if you read those letters, you see that the Jews were lied about. They were slandered. They were made, they had false accusations made against them. Um, they were intimidated. They were threatening and bullying, right? And these are how the enemies of the gospel will respond. They will reveal themselves over time by their fruit. Zerubbabel had the guts to call them out. He had the guts to stand up, the courage to stand up to them. He saw through their falseness because he had God's discernment within them. So the principle here is that God's work will almost always be opposed. Right, we say that a lot. We kind of live in this world of comfort, of ease, of leisure, right? We kind of, we kind of, we, we, we kind of, I think when we become Christians, we kind of carry it into our Christian living, right? And we, and we, and, and we think that, you know, God's will is the easy way. And so, so often we, you know, in the church, we set out to do a work for God and then, you know, at the first sign of trouble or difficulty or hardship, right? What is our response? Oh, I guess it wasn't God's will. Oh, maybe it's not God's timing. Oh, God closed the door. Now, sometimes he does, right? Sometimes God closes the doors. But we have to be very careful because not every closed door is from God. And do we want to be known as such wimpy Christians that we cave and quit at the first sign of trouble? Heaven forbid, no, because I do not see in scripture and I do not see from my 35 years of walking with God, I do not see that God's way is the easy way. Sometimes it is, and we like that, we prefer that, <laughs> but most often God's way is the harder way and that's okay. I mean, I look at not just here in Ezra, but I mean, think about it, Paul, life of Paul, think of all the disciples, um, they didn't have it easy, uh, but they obeyed God's call. Um, think of Jesus. I mean, it's, it's God's way is often the harder way, but that's okay. Because for those that have the courage to persevere, to walk by faith, you will see God's reward and he will, he will take the burden from you. Not necessarily make our circumstances easier, but he will give you the strength. He will give you the wisdom. He will give you the endurance to persevere and your faith will grow and you will be blessed with a, a feeling of a closeness of, of God's presence in your life um, and his peace and his joy will be upon you and you will feel the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit at work in you. You will get to the end of the job and you will look back and you'll be like, oh, I don't know how I did that because I, I know I didn't do it. I know God did it through me because I couldn't do it. I wanted to quit. You know? <laughs> and, and God will take you to new heights of faith he will find you faithful in smaller things. He will give you bigger things to be faithful for. And your faith will grow and you will soar. And your eyes, God will take your eyes and put them on eternity uh, where he wants them. You will set your focus on the king and his kingdom. Um, and you will see that, that it's not even about the doing for God, but it's more about the being. That you are God's loved, beloved, uh, holy child and you will, that will make you want to glorify him more. The more you feel his presence and you feel his love and his care for you, then you will then want to glorify him more and you will find more enjoyment in him. And it's a wonderful, positive cycle. Um, and you will find that you are, are fulfilling your created purpose, that you are, uh, that we are to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So you will find great joy in walking with him. When you walk with Jesus and you obey the call, you will be lied about. You will be falsely accused. You will have complaints lodged against you. You will be slandered. You will be persecuted. You will have your words taken out of context and twisted it to mean something that you didn't mean it to mean. And that's okay. Because the longer you walk with God, the more you will see that in a way it's almost like a, a weird like confirmation like, 
yeah, I am doing God's will because they're trying to stop me. So you will have, God will use that opposition as an assurance that you're doing the right thing in God's eyes. Now, just a word of caution. <laughs> You have to make sure you have to like you have to like really humbly search your heart to make sure that 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 you know when people are coming against you that it's not you that it's not like you being a knucklehead or not your flesh you know because if I'm rude to someone and they're rude back to me I'm just getting what I deserve you know and so I've had situations where you know if I feel this tension or I feel this like opposition or something's going on like I have ha many occasions I've gone to that person to be like. You know, I'm kind of feeling something between us and I just want to make sure we're good like is there anything that I've done to offend you is there anything that I have to seek forgiveness for and if there is like I totally apologize like I you know just will right then and there just try to make it right but then if they continue to be uh, uh, you know opposed to you then you know okay or if there is nothing then you know okay you know this is this is this is the work of God and it's not me and you just have to you know, have the, just like you were talking about right before we started, just to have that peace, like, you know, it's kind of on them, and, it, and you kind of feel bad for them, because they're in a rough place with God. Um, so, um, the good thing is to know that Satan's strategies to discourage us from the will of God, to dissuade us from the call of God, to cause us to doubt, to despair, to fear, to be um, paralyzed by our fear and anxiety, uh, those strategies that the enemy has has not changed for thousands of years. Well, almost 2,500 or maybe more than 2,500 to be exact here, right? And they're very predictable. Satan's schemes are very predictable. And Zerubbabel showed um, to be a man of incredible um, discernment for God's will and he knew uh, and he also had the courage um, to stand up to the enemies. So what do we do when we hit opposition? Like I said, you know, first of all, you know, you have to search your heart and you have to really humbly self-examine to make sure it's not something. And sometimes God will put it on your heart like, oh man, I may have offended that person. And then go to them and ask for forgiveness. Um, then see, search God's heart because often, you know, God uh, will put something on your heart, uh, uh, something to do for him. And, um, and again, like, if God is going to close the door, and sometimes God closes the door, I think because he wants to test our hearts and make sure we're willing to obey him. But a lot of times I think that what we call a closed doors aren't closed doors. So um, we like to say like, okay, you know, you have to be 100% sure in order to abandon your post. You have to be 100% sure that that's God. Um, so um, that takes a lot of discernment. Um, and... Um, a lot of times, you know, one of the things, so it also takes a lot of discernment to know, well, like what we're talking about, like, when do I stay and fight and when do I let go and let God deal with it? And that is a great question, requires a lot of discernment and it's a, it's a skill that we develop as we go on in life. What fights are those that we are, we are to fight, that God wants to fight through us? And what fights are not our own and I think we in the church that we grow up in the church and we 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 tend to I think we tend to fight the battles that are not ours to fight and then we run from the battles that maybe God wants to fight through us and that causes an immense amount of stress in our lives mm -hmm. um, so again we need discernment knowing when to, to we need we need that godly discernment to know what what battles are us, ours to fight and we need and when I say discernment I mean we need um, God's wisdom to be able to apply his word to our circumstance and leave the results to God. That's very important. So we'll get more into that. So what are the principles to building discernment? You know, again, so again, don't abandon your post until you're absolutely sure <laughs> that's God's will. Practice the principles of abiding in Christ. Go back, read John 15. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me. Now why? The branch needs to abide in the vine because the vine is the one responsible. The vine takes the nutrients and the water and what the branch needs from the ground and delivers it to the branch so that the branch has what it needs. It has energy, it has nutrients, it has life to produce fruit. Um, and the branch's responsibility is to hold on. So that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus, it's Jesus' responsibility as we 
stay, stay attached to him. He will provide everything we need for life and growth and bearing fruit. Um, and how do we do this? Um, we need to be obviously number one, first and foremost in the word, um, every day. Uh, we need to be um, learning God's word, uh, loving God's word, praying on God's word, um, prayer, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, all the disciplines that we talk about, um, confessing our sin, asking the Holy Spirit to fill us. Um, these are disciplines that are hard. They take time to develop, right? Um, you don't necessarily see the results right away, but as you look back, as you do these things every day, as you take your quiet time every day and you spend time with the Lord and you, you really try to hook into the vine, you know, or you spend time with Jesus in prayer and in the word and be asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, over time you see the results. That when that opposition does hit, you will have, you know, in that daily quiet time, over time, over years and years and years, you, God will give you the discernment that you need through the word. Now, back um, in Ezra's time and in the time that we're, of history that we're studying, you know, the primary way that God spoke to the people was through the prophets. Well, now um, the primary way God speaks to us is through his word. And as we read his word and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will enlighten us. So we want to hear from God. We need his discernment. We need his wisdom. We need to know how to apply his wisdom to our circumstance and trust him. Um, we want to be in the word. Um, but that's not the only way. That's the primary way, but not the only way. You know, we also want to um, have relationships with older women, older uh, people in the Lord, um, not necessarily chronologically, but, but that have walked with the Lord for longer than us. Um, they will give us wisdom. The Holy Spirit will speak through others because often when God puts a call on someone's heart, he often um, confirms that call on other people. Um, so seek out um, older uh, people. Um, seek out your Christian brothers and sisters to confirm the call and to help them find discernment. And then just keep, one of the main things that I do when I hit opposition is I just keep reminding myself of God's word. Just these things keep coming to my brain. Um, and again, it's from years of studying the word, but, 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 you know, I will say like, like, okay, the Holy Spirit's within me. Greater is he that is, I don't have to fear because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the word. I will tell myself, perfect love casts out all fear. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I have these, these verses go through my brain when I hit opposition. I go back to the Psalms, all over the Psalms. God is my strength. He's my fortress. He's my shield. He's my deliverer. I shall not fear. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in him. Take heart. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Do not be anxious, but in everything, with prayers and petition, present your requests to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. No weapon, if God is for you, who can be against you? No, but no weapon formed against me shall prosper. We see, you know, Jesus said, be as cunning as snakes and yet as innocent as doves. That means that we need to be wise according to worldly eyes and we need to be able to navigate this world, right? But to do it um, in a worldly way, but not in a sinful way. So there's those, you know, those things. And God develops these skills over time. Jeff had a professor, Doug Grothuis, years ago, 25 years ago. His favorite saying is, you can get into a fight with a skunk and win, but who wants to? <laughs> <laughs> right? This is true, right? And then we say it all the time. When you come up against slander, the best, the best response to slander is a life well lived, right? So instead of going back at them, blah, 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 with the same, you know, mouthing off, blah, 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 trying to get your story out there, blah, blah, blah. No, you know what? Our battle's the Lord's. God has your back. Um, we are to live a life of love and grace and peace and like all the characteristics that God's revealing within us um, and just quietly just go about doing what God has called you to because and move forward in faith and do not back down, right? And do not above all else, trust in God, trust that God will, will reveal truth in his time and, and just keep focused on the task that God has given you and, and just do it you know, as if just unto the Lord, because as if God is your only um, audience, because all these tactics that Satan uses, it's all to get your, you know, the lies and the slander and the false accusations, blah, blah, blah. We get so wrapped up in that 
and it's, it's, a, it's an energy sucker, mm. right? It takes our mind off of the king and the kingdom. It takes our energy away from doing the work of the kingdom, right? So just remember, Satan will want to get your eyes off of the prize. So God has your back. Leave it with him. Again, a life, uh, a life well lived is the best response. So, you know, so, okay. And then, and then trust, trust God with your work. You know, you know, God sets our hearts to do something and it doesn't matter how big or how small in the worldly eyes we think like, like if we feel God calling us to teach, um, preschool or Sunday school, you know, you might week after week, not really think like you're doing much, but don't forget, like the Jews that are laying the foundation brick after brick after brick for the temple, you know, we now, because we are, the, the Holy Spirit resides in us, we are, scripture says we are kind of a temple. And by building into these little children, even if they're three, four years old and you don't think they're getting it, you are, God is using you to lay that foundation that they will remember, that they will draw upon, that they will build upon as they get older. And that in the eyes, you might think it's not significant, but in the eyes of eternity, it's huge. It's huge to God. So we are faithful to obey God's call, you know, again. And then we trust God, you know, when, when you're faithful, you faithfully obey God's call and you trust God with the results and trust that it will bring glory to him uh, in heaven for all of eternity. Okay, so back to Ezra. Over time, um, they did get worn out and I can't remember how many years, but we are told that the work of the house of the Lord did come to a standstill. Um, so it was a number of years. Um, enter in Haggai. Um, now, Haggai was not the only prophet um, trying to motivate the Jews to get back to work. Um, and that's why it kind of seems weird. We're going to start Zechariah next week. I think it's next week. We're going to start Zechariah and then we'll come back around and finish with Zechariah. But the reason we're doing Zechariah next week too is because he was also preaching during the time, this time, alongside Haggai. So both of them were working to motivate. Um, so, so we look at Haggai and what an amazing book it was. And for the sake of time, we're going to go really fast. So I hope that um, we can draw more out in our discussion. Um, so Haggai, he, he, he comes, he's called by God and, you know, he comes to Zerubbabel and, um, the high priest Joshua and the leaders. And he's like, look, what is going on? Is it this, the time that God has called for us to rebuild his home? Why are you building, uh, your own homes when God's home is in disrepair, disarray? So he's like, look, give careful, so I'm in Haggai chapter one, give careful thought to your ways. Like, he's like, think about what's going on. Okay, so you're focusing on yourself. And he basically goes through this like litany of things that they're doing. And he's like, look, you're planting, but you're not harvesting. You're thirsty, but you're not having, you're drinking, but you're not having your thirst filled. You're working, but you're not earning wages enough to live. Like, he's like, look, God's trying to get your attention. He's trying to, to get you to, to turn and, and, and get back in line with, with God's will, with God's, God's um, plan for you. Um, so so um, Haggai comes and he's like, look, he reminds them, look, um, he's like, look, God says, God is with you. The Holy Spirit is moving within you. Chapter two, he's like, be strong. Do the work that God has coveted with you. And then he says in verse nine, chapter two, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And then he goes on at the end to say that, you know, to Zerubbabel, that you are the signet ring. You are the one chosen by God and I, I and to do this. And I think really, you know, what he's basically saying and what my, my study notes say is that Zerubbabel, you are, um, you are um, an ancestor of the Messiah. The Messiah is coming. The reason that the temple that you are building is going to be greater is because the chosen one, the Messiah, Jesus is going to come and he's going to stand in this temple. So, so keep going, keep pressing on. That's, that's kind of my take on it. Um, and, and there's probably even, I'm getting goosebumps because I kind of feel like there's probably even more of eternity. Like when we get to the end time, there's going to be more significance to this, which we can pull out as we get, as we go further along in our study. We're in, um, not today, but other days we're going to talk about the end times. Um, so, so, um, okay. So, um, back to Ezra. <laughs> so Ezra, um, the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, 
they motivate the people to get back to work. And then we're told that they complete uh, the job and there is, uh, oh, actually, before we get there, sorry, <coughs> go back to uh, chapter, uh, chapters four, five, and six. Um, again, people are, um, the enemies are lodging complaints against the king and uh, King Darius, we are told, uh, is questioning what is true. He decides to go back to the royal archives and see what is true and what is not true. Did Cyrus really write these decrees? And sure enough, God in his greatness and his sovereignty caused Darius, King Darius, to look at um, the exact decree. He was able to find the decree that Cyrus wrote, and then he was able to say, oh, wait a minute, not only did Cyrus, not only what the Jews are saying is true, that Cyrus did ordain the building of the temple, but I'm supposed to pay for it. So here you go. <laughs> and oh, by the way, what else does Cyrus say? Which little uh, uh, detail that had been overlooked. Any money that interferes with this, punishable by death. <laughs> so not only did God make the way, God paid the way, and then God protected them. Isn't that awesome? So Jesus promises, and, and God just, you know, God, he does. He does that when he gives you work to do. He will guard you. He will make the way. He will enable you to do it. Um, he will finish the work that he's completed in you. That's a promise. Um, Philippians 1, 6, he will complete that work that he's done in you. He promises it. Um, so, okay, so... So be strong um, ooh, for the sake of time. Okay, 7 to 10. We're going to go really, really, really fast. Okay, so then uh, we see, remember what we said last week? Um, the time between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7 was about 57 years. That is the time that uh, Esther uh, that we talked about last week uh, took place during this time. Um, Artaxerxes, King Artaxerxes comes to power. <laughs> he, um, uh, we're told that they're pretty sure that he was either Esther's, Queen Esther's son or stepson. And it doesn't surprise us because he's very, again, another king that's very favorable to the Jews. And he releases another uh, group of Jews that come back uh, to Jerusalem to help the building. And Ezra, we're told, uh, is a priest uh, who comes back in that second wave. We're told about him, uh, chapter 7, verse 10, Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and the teaching and decrees and the law of Israel. Okay, so Ezra didn't only know the law, but he lived the law. He obeyed the law. He's a great example for us that we should not only be hearers of the word, but we should be doers of the word. Okay, and then he comes back and he's troubled because he's told... Uh, okay, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the temple's completed, great joy, yay. Uh, <laughs> but then there's great sadness because um, Ezra is told that the people of, uh, the Jewish people have again began intermarrying um, with people that are not devoted to the Lord. And, you know, why is this a problem? Okay, so this is a problem because this is not God's, um, plan and again this is we need to look at this in the context of this is the time period for what God is telling the Jews at this time because God had a very special plan for the Jews and that plan was in jeopardy because we saw like Ezra his response is to weep right because this is exactly why they were exiled in the first place God was disciplining them well why is that because the principle is that you know when um, when you when when a, when a, um, when a believer marries a non-believer, um, more often than not, the believer gets kind of pulled away from God, and this distance is distanced from God. So God's ideal plan is that a believer would marry another believer, and that they would help each other to uh, strive and to um, help each other in the Lord. So that when one's weak and the one's down, the other one can help, and vice versa. And we see that. Uh, so God says a cord of um, three is not easily broken. So the, uh, the, the husband, wife, and the Lord, all entwined, uh, is a very strong, strong, powerful, uh, powerful thing in the kingdom. But here, um, Ezra then um, is so distraught because he, like, he prays, he's like, oh God, 
was like, here we go again. Didn't they learn the first time? This is why we're in this mess. He's like, I think he wanted to be like, okay, just wipe us out right now. <laughs> just, just wipe us off the face of the map. So we deserve it. Um, but, and, and then he issues a really tough degree. And again, for this time, for this place, and he tells the people you have to separate from your spouses, from your unbelieving spouses. And what heartache, what horribleness. Um, this was just so, this must, to, to obey this must have been incredibly hard. And what do we say? Obey, and it's a principle for us, that obeying God and repenting from our sin is so hard. And it takes such courage and it takes such humility and it takes a lot of faith. Why? Because you need to trust God with the results. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. And Jeff and I have heard, I'm honest to God, we have heard elders say, I know God's word says this, but we're not going to do it because it seems harsh. And then they do what they want. And then it's like, oh, down the line, disaster. Really? Are we surprised? The best thing is when you're tempted to sin, just when it's just a thought, when it's just a temptation, before it's able to snowball, it's the best thing is to confess and ask the Holy Spirit to remove it, to help you not walk in that way, right? Because the more the sin snowballs, the harder it is to repent of. We know that. So Ezra wept. He wept for the people's sin. And it's just a good, you know, thing for us to remember that if we... We, once we become a Christian, we are forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, future. We still need to take our sin seriously because God does, because our sin hurts us. Our sin, even as a believer, will cause harm. It will cause sorrow for us down the road. It will cause sorrow for other people will sorrow for us. It will cause sorrow in their, our sin will cause sorrow in their lives as well. Um, so again, to just to be able to root it out, because our sin, if we keep persisting in it, it will cause us to be frustrated, it will cause us to be unfulfilled, um, and again, it will bring a lot of sorrow. Um, so the people were told, um, they obeyed, they had the courage and the faith to obey, and I really believe that God used that down the line to prevent um, a lot worse consequences. Okay, so overall, the message of Ezra and Haggai God is at work in us and through us. He has work for us to do. God's work will be opposed. We need to be prepared for that, not surprised by it, right? And God, you know, we need to be discerning. We need to stay attached to the vine because it is through the Holy Spirit that he will give us the wisdom. He will give us the discernment. He will give us the energy, the power, whatever we need uh, for life and for uh, obeying the call, that perseverance that we need. We need to be strong, we need to not give up, we need to have courage. Um, uh, he, will, uh, uh, he will fight for you, um, and as you honor him, even if you feel like what you're doing for God fails or, or you're disappointed in the outcome, again, God's not disappointed. God knows, God will take your faithfulness and your heart and the things that you set your heart to do he will make great things, great um, uh, glory for him in eternity. It's more about eternity. It's not about what we see here, right? We serve for an audience of one. Seek to glorify God. You will find great enjoyment in that. Walk by faith. Trust him with the results, right? He will make the way and he will pay your way. Amen? Amen. Amen.